Thanks for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, so I'll talk about um, several joint works with various subsets of uh, Kaiser Matamaki, Ma Maxim Razzurri, uh, Ferdinand Shaw, Terry Tao, and Thomas Ziegler. Uh, and all of these works relate to the Gaussian uniformity of various ethnic functions in short intervals. Um, okay, so let's first um, let me first uh, explain what sort of ethnic functions we're looking at. Um, so uh, take some interesting <coughs> function f. Uh, now, of course, there are too many interesting area functions to consider, but uh, in this talk, I'll restrict to three um, very important ones. Um, so one is the Mervish function, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, another one is the Pomelo function. So it's a weighted integrator of the primes. So if n is a power of prime p, then lambda of n is log p, zero otherwise. So this is mean value one. And we also consider the uh, divisor function and higher order versions of that. So tau k of n is defined as a number of ways. One can write n as a product of k natural numbers. Um, okay. One could consider also some other algebraic functions using uh, the methods from these papers. Um, so certainly anything I say for Mebius would also work for the label function. Um, also, one could obtain some results for the um, representation function of the sum of two squares. Um, and yeah, the methods are somewhat flexible, so one could possibly also work out some other um, interesting algebraic functions. But in this talk, I just restrict attention to these three ones. Okay, and so if we want to understand the Gaussian uniformity of an arbitrary function, we should certainly make sure that the Fourier coefficients of the function are small, because that's a condition already for the U2 Gaussian uniformity of the function, that the, uh, that the Fourier coefficients should be small. And therefore, we're led to ask the following um, question, which I'll consider for, uh, for the next several slides. So um, if we take one of our interesting functions f, um, and if e of x denotes the complex exponential, so e of x is always e to the two pi i x, then what's the smallest theta for which we can control the short exponential sums of f from x to x plus x to the theta twisted by a polynomial exponential phase? Um, and so p of x here is a polynomial of a fixed degree. Um, okay, so if we want to understand this question, um, I want to first ask what's known for theta equals one. So that's the easiest case. So um, if theta is equal to one, that's the long interval case. So then we have a dyadic sum of f twisted by a polynomial exponential phase. And so let's say p of x is of degree uh, p. Um, so already in the 1930s, um, Vinogradov, Davenport, and Hua wrote several important works where they uh, essentially solved this problem for these long dialect sums. So they showed that um, sums of f twisted by e of p of n have an arbitrary power of log cancellation uh, for f being any of our three functions, unless p of x is made to arc. <coughs> um, of course, there needs to be some condition on p, because if p is, for example, the constant polynomial, and f is the polynomial function, then there's no cancellation in the sum. Um, and so the major arc, uh, p of x being major arc, basically means that the coefficients of p are very close to being rational numbers of small denominator. Um, and more quantitatively, it means that there's some integer q less than a power of log, such that if the coefficients of p are alpha j, then the distance of q alpha j to the nearest integer is very, very small in this quantitative sense. Um, so it means that the um, polynomial p of x doesn't vary very rapidly, so it's, it's very slowly. Very, um, 
So this case needs to be considered separately. Uh, these um, various authors in 1930s proved that if P of X is not major arc, then you have good cancellation. So what about the case of major arc? Polynomials. Um, okay, so if a polynomial P has essentially uh, rational coefficients with the denominator Q uh, and Q is bounded by a power of log, then what we could do is just um, <coughs> split our sum into aromatic progressions modulo Q. Um, so we can pull out essentially the E of P of A because if, if the coefficients are uh, personal numbers uh, with denominators divided in Q, then it's Q periodic. So you can pull out the E of P of A and inside you have a sum of F over magnetic questions. And sums of uh, any of our functions F, so the memory function for memory function tau k, we can understand in our progressions um, by the Siegel office theorem. So we can evaluate um, up to good accuracy what these inner sums are, and it gives some main, main term for the exponent sum of F. Um, for example, in the case of von Mangold, one would just use uh, the primary theorem and arithmetic progressions and get some main term out of here, which involves permanent and sums. Um, however, uh, especially for the case of the higher order divisor function, uh, the main term looks relatively complicated. Um, and if we get even more complicated, uh, if one was working with linear sequences, as later we will. Um, so it's better not to do the um, major arc minor arc distinction for our results. They're easier to state if um, we don't do the distinction, but instead do something else, which gives us unified results for any polynomial. So then we don't need to write down the main terms. And how to get unified results uh, for all polynomials? Um, so the idea is kind of uh, motivated by uh, the transference principles in analytic combinatorics, such as the green tar transference principle. Um, so if we can find uh, for our given function f, a simpler function, f model, which models that function in arithmetic progressions, so it has the same behavior in arithmetic progressions, then um, f, if you look at f minus the model function, then there should be no main term when you look at the sum in every proportions. And therefore, regardless whether P of X is major arc or minor arc, you should have cancellation in your sum. And of course, for this to be meaningful, the model function needs to be simpler to work with than the original function. So we want to replace the complicated function F, let's say the one minor function, by some much simpler model function, such that the behavior in binary progressions is the same, but we can directly work with the model function in our problems. Um, say we have, for example, uh, countilinear equations weighted by f. Um, then if we know that f minus f model, um, the exponent sums of that are small, then we can pass on to the model function and just count the uh, linear patterns weighted by the model function, which is often quite a bit easier. Um, okay, so that's the um, approach we take for stating our results. And the natural question is, which models should we pick for our functions? Um, okay, so for the Mibbis function, it's very easy uh, because uh, the Mibbis function has no main term when you look at the sum in hybrid progressions, that's just cancellation. So we don't need to separate any function from the Mibbis function. So just take mu model to be zero. Um, for the for Mangle function, um, we um, take the same model as, for example, Green and Tau take in the uh, linear equations in primes work. Um, so um, you compare the primes to the rough numbers. So numbers with no small prime factors. Um, so if you take W to be a suitable parameter, little w, uh, it's not too important what the choice of little w is. It only influences the uh, quality of the error terms. Um, and if you take the model function, like the model to be a normalized version of the indicator of numbers having no prime factors less than w, then that's a good model for the full manual function. Um, so firstly, one can check that in arithmetic progressions, it behaves exactly similarly as the full manual function. 
And secondly, it's a simpler function to work with. One can, for example, use basic C theory to evaluate things like the correlations of the function lambda model. Um, and for the higher divisor functions, um, the model looks a bit more complicated. Um, so I won't write it quite explicitly, but it's um, a short divisor sum. So the divisor m here goes only up to a very small, very small power of x, so that's the eta, where eta is an arbitrary number. Um, and the point is that this function, so this PMT are some explicit polynomials, which I don't have the space to write here, but um, the point is that this is a type one sum. So uh, the divisor m is very small, and therefore one can evaluate things like the correlations of this model function or the Gauss norms. Um, and this model is formed by uh, taking the uh, um, generalized Dirichlet hyperbola identity for uh, the function tau k and replacing uh, sort of approximate sums by integrals. Um, but I won't go more into that. Uh, the point is, it's, it's a quite a sharp model for tau k in, in the sense that I can even get power saving error terms when I compare tau k with this model. Are there any questions so far? The right hand side is easier to work with. Uh, why, why this model function is easier to work with? Yeah. Um, because it's a type one sum. So the, um, so the n variable there is very short. Um, so if you have, let's say, a correlation of, uh, so you have a shifted product of several copies of the function, it's still a short device sum. So one can evaluate explicitly what it gives. And this PM, or that it didn't write them, they're explicit polynomials. So um, yeah. One can work out all sorts of correlation asymptotics for this other function. Okay, any other question? Um, okay, so let me now discuss what was known previously um, for this uh, main question. And one can ask the question either for all intervals, so all x, or for all morphologs. x. And let's first consider the case of all x. And so in the case of the polynomial function, um, so first one can of course consider what happens for the constant polynomial. So if the degree of p is zero, in that case there's a 50-year-old result of Huxley, which says that we understand these sums if the length is x to the seven over twelve of epsilon. So that's kind of the limit what we can hope for for the high degree case because. Uh, even for the, I mean, the degree zero case would be the easiest one, even though it's not, not an easy case. Um, so for degree one polynomials uh, with the following function, there's a result of Zan, um, which says that for intervals length x to the 5 over 8 was epsilon, we understand these sums. And a few years ago, Matamaki and Shao considered the high degree case and showed that um, if the interval length is actually two thirds plus epsilon, um, we have good control of these sums. And finally, as uh, Adam mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, Konikovsky, Lamanchik, and Rajaviv uh, could do um, uh, slightly improve on Matamagia Shao to two thirds minus eta. Yeah. What's the, I guess, conjectural limit of what h can be? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so it should be true even for very, very small h. Okay. Um, so I think, so if, uh, if there was no exponential twist, so if p was just constant, it would just be a sort of the formula function, uh, then Cromer's conjecture predicts that um, if h is bigger than uh, log squared of x, okay. there should be some, uh, some amount of cancellation. <coughs> uh, so I, I would guess that if h is, let's say, a large power of log, then this should be true. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, what about the Möbius case? Um, so Mathematik and I showed that for the Möbius case, if you don't have a twist, so just looking at the short sum of Möbius, um, one can do it also find uh, x to uh, 11 over 20 plus epsilon. So that's 0 0.55. Um, and also for the degree one case, we showed that 
one can take the exponent three fifths, so zero point six. And for, for the high degree case, uh, the result of Matamaki and Shao also applies to the Möbius function equally well as for the Tomago function, and it gives the same exponent. So, um, so two thirds plus the previous exponent also for the Möbius function for the higher degree case. <laughs> Um, and finally, for the divisor function, uh, there are not that many results, but from the method of Matamaki and Shao, one could extract that um, one has cancellation in this exponential sum if uh, the length is um, x to the one half in the case of uh, k cos two, uh, or uh, x to the two thirds in the case of uh, k equal to three. Um, Okay, so these were the um, previous known results for uh, all intervals. Uh, and what about almost all intervals? So now um, it's all about the same question. So f is one of our uh, functions of interest. And we ask what's the smallest value of theta such that for almost all x up to x, um, we have cancellation in this exponential sum. And note that there's a supremum over the polynomial, which makes the problem harder. So for every interval, you take the worst possible polynomial that makes the sum the largest. Um, so that's extra complication. Um, so um, for the degree zero case, again, uh, an old result of Ramachandra shows that um, one can handle indicates the primes. Uh, some will find x to the one over six. Um, and famously, Matomaki and Radziwiv showed that for the Berbys function, uh, if the degree is zero, so there's no twist, um, one can have a very good result. So one can have theta equals epsilon, or in fact, uh, the sum of length could be arbitrarily small. Anything that tends to infinity would be fine. Uh, so that's the uh, big result. Um, for the degree one case, um, uh, sorry, again, degree zero case, but for the higher order, higher order divisor function, Matamaki, Versiviv, and Tau uh, showed that one can handle intervals like x to epsilon. So here it can't be an arbitrarily short interval because Tau k has some fluctuation in very short intervals, but they could do a certain power of log length intervals. And finally, in another paper, Matamaki, Rajiv, and Tao showed that for the Möbius function uh, at degree one, so linear phases, they could do uh, intervals like next to epsilon. Okay, but those are pretty much the known results. Yes, for, uh, yeah. Just quickly, on the, the stuff for all intervals, were you scrupulously only quoting things that don't assume GRH? Ah, uh, yeah, these are all unconditional. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that change apart from the first one if you assume GRH or. It's, um, it's a good question. Uh, so the first ones would change for every um, every point. So if the degree is zero, then uh, RH gives us good control on just the uh, sums of any of our RH functions. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, GRH would help for the higher degree case. Um, yeah, it, I, I think it would help a little bit. It would improve the ex exponents a little bit. But maybe not all the way to one half, which will be the exponent for uh, for the degree zero case under RH. <coughs> um, okay. So now we come to the first main theorem, which is about all intervals. Uh, so with Matamaki, Shaman, and Tau uh, last year. So if f is any of our functions of interest, um, and if you look at this. Short technical sum, we have some cancellation in this sum uh, in the following cases. So if f is either the Möbius function or the Von Mangel function, we can do uh, exponent 5 over 8 and saving an arbitrary power of log in the estimate. If f is the Möbius function or the uh, either device function, we can do exponent three over fifth uh, with a small power of log. 
And if f is um, tau k, then we can do a power saving x estimate. So delta is small power of x. Um, and the exponent is um, one third for uh, tau two, uh, five over nine for tau three, and five over eight for uh, tau k where k is at least four. And just to remind you, these are the model functions of uh, Burbage and the primes that we are comparing them to. So D doesn't feature at all down. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's independent of the de degree. It just needs to be a fixed number. Uh, yeah. So for any degree, it's the same result. Um, okay. So that's the main result we had for uh, all intervals. And how does it compare to previous results? So as you can note, um, the exponent five over eight is the same as Zan's exponent for the degree one case. So our result extends that to arbitrary degree. Uh, so the previous record was two thirds for higher degree, um, or two thirds minus eta. And the second result uh, gives the same exponent as Matamaki and I had for uh, the degree one case again. Okay, so that's that. And um, okay, so in the case of tau two, and no twist, uh, the exponent is one third. Uh, so that matches the classical Voronoi exponent from about 100 years ago for sums of tau two. So uh, Voronoi proved that uh, one can understand sums of tau two of length x to one third. That has been improved a bit uh, over the last 100 years, but not by much. So the exponent has been improved by much. So uh, we get the same exponent for higher degree. Um, I guess, to what extent do you know your model functions are the best possible choices? Um, it's not necessarily the best possible. It kind of depends on your problem. So okay. one could do several different model functions. So uh, depending on the problem, uh, for example, one could you also use uh, models that come from Fourier analysis, okay. kind of from the major arc contribution. Let's say uh, uh, for the primes, one could uh, take the major arc contribution uh, when one is doing the circle method, and that would give a certain model function for the primes. And for certain other problems, that might be better to work with. Okay. Uh, but kind of for uh, maybe for additive combinatorics problems, it's very convenient to have non-negative um, <coughs> model functions. And all of our uh, model functions are non-negative. So that's uh, helpful. And also um, the fact that they're all uh, type one sums. Okay. So those are kind of the important properties. Yeah, but there's some flexibility. <laughs> Okay, and what about all in, uh, almost all intervals? Um, so the setup is the same, except now we look at um, almost all values of x. So we throw away uh, x divided by an arbitrary power of log, number of bad values, obviously don't understand this sum, and we get cancellation in the following cases. So for the fundamental function, we can now do interval length uh, x to one third, Whereas previously it was x to the 5 over 8 for all intervals and saving an arbitrary power of log. And for the Möbius function and tau k, we can do intervals of length x to the epsilon. Uh, but now the saving delta is fixed. So it's a fixed number, any fixed number. Um, and so as far as I know, uh, the <coughs> X minus sum of the primes in almost all sorted intervals wasn't really considered much. And the exponent known for all intervals, of course, applies to the almost all intervals as well, but I'm not aware of any uh, better exponent, obviously. And so the tau k result uh, is new in this forthcoming work. And the result for the Möbius function uh, we had before in a different paper with Matamaki, Razavi, Tau, and Ziegler. Um, so the only improvement here is the exceptional set. So now we save uh, an arbitrary power of log in the size of the exceptional set. Um, and now let me mention this, uh, this final results here. So the one we had from 2020. Um, so we proved that <laughs> the Möbius function case um, for almost all values of x, we can actually go even beyond x to epsilon. So even shorter intervals, 
namely intervals of length e to the log x to the 5 over 8 plus epsilon. Um, and previously, uh, Matomaki, Razavi, and Tal uh, considered the linear case and proved this for uh, x to the epsilon length intervals. And perhaps the most interesting thing about short technical sums of the Mavis function is that um, they relate to Charles' conjecture. Um, namely, uh, we showed in the same work that if one could somehow improve this exponent to much shorter interval length, namely intervals of length log to the epsilon for any epsilon, then that would imply Charles' conjecture in the logarithmic form. Uh, and in fact, these conjectures are somewhat equivalent. So, uh, so if we have Chawla, then this conjecture would follow actually for arbitrary slowly growing age. Now, needless to say, we're quite far from logos to epsilon. We're somewhere at e to the log to some power, mm -hmm. uh, but that shows the connection to you. Sorry? Did you just say that if you could get log x to the epsilon for any epsilon, then Charles connects to Yeah, yeah. So there's a jump. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting phenomenon. There's a jump. Yeah, <laughs> because if you get to log to epsilon, then you get Chawla, and then you get arbitrarily slowly growing age. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Um. Okay, so um, all of the results I mentioned work not only for polynomial phases but also for new sequence trees. So one could twist uh, f minus the model by a new sequence. So take a new manifold, g mod gamma, uh, of bounded dimensional complexity, take ellipsis function f on that new manifold, and take a polynomial sequence from the integers to your Lie group g. And all the results would be the same as before, uh, except the final one. So there we did for polynomial phases in the case of uh, e to the log, uh, with e to the log x to the 5 over 8, and for new sequences with x to the epsilon. Uh, but there's some hope that that could also be improved for, for new sequences. Um, so all the exponents are the same as before. For example, we can handle uh, full angle twisted by new sequences with exponent 5 over 8, or the two, uh, second divisive function with exponent 1 over 3, and so on. Um, but actually, the proofs are a bit different. So I'll, I'll talk later a little bit about the proofs. Um, but for the non abelian case, so the case where you don't have a classical polynomial, um, we need some extra work compared to the uh, case of abelian G, actually. So, for example, the result of Matamek and Shaw was only for the um, polynomial phases and not for the sequences. Um, okay, but since we have results now for F twisted by new sequences, we can get to Gauss uniformity. Um, I care about the Lipschitz constant on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, so the estimates depend on the Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant. Yeah. yeah. So the Lipschitz constant needs to be bounded. Yeah, that's good Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have okay. a question, I guess. Sure. Um, so I know you described this introduction of a model uh, function so as to kind of avoid the major arc. Yeah, are, yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering if you're looking at a null sequence twist, is there still a meaningful thing to talk about major arc? Is that yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, equidistributed or non equidistributed null sequences. So that will be kind of major arc, minor arc. This kind of way yeah. 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 And yeah. So by so subtracting this model, we completely avoid the problem of having to do any kind of distinction. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Okay, so now we come to Gauss uniformity. Um, so Freddie already mentioned Gauss norms in his talk. Uh, so here I'll look at functions defined on the integers with finite support. And then one can define the Gauss norm over the integers um, as a non-normalized sum. So you just take the sum of f over these k-dimensional parallel pipettes, to the power one over two to the k. Um, and then one can define Gauss norms in short intervals. So the Gauss norm of f, UK Gauss norm over x, x plus h, is defined as the UK z Gauss norm of f um, restricted to the interval x, x plus h. 
and you normalize it so that um, if f is one, you get one. Uh, so kind of a trivial bound is one if your function is bounded and you want to get cancellation. So you want to get bounds of this little one shape. Okay. And thanks to the inverse term for the Gauss norms of Greenhouse and Ziegler, we can directly apply our nil sequence results to transfer them to Gauss norm results. So if we are working with the same functions f as, as before, and we subtract the model, we can show that uh, f minus the model is UK Gauss uniform in intervals of length x to the theta in any of the following cases. So the exponents are exactly the same as before. Uh, so anything I said for nil sequences, the exponent is the same for Gauss norms. So for example, for the formula function, the exponent is five over eight for all intervals and one third but for almost all intervals. And for Mobius, it's three fifths for all intervals and arbitrary small epsilon for almost all intervals. Okay, and it's this Gauss norm result that we use for our applications. So uh, let me now discuss some applications of our results. So this uh, Gauss uniformity result helps us to count various linear patterns weighted by our functions. So in particular, we can do linear equations in primes, so the linear equations here of Greenthal and Ziegler, but now in short intervals. And um, so we proved that um, if you take any system of linear equations and you're looking for solutions to the primes, <coughs> then your primes are restricted to uh, a short interval like this, so of length x to the 5 over 8, then one can find uh, solutions to this system of equations, provided there is finite complexity, first of all, and secondly, there should be no local obstructions or global obstructions. So, uh, yeah, there should not be any modulo p problem for any prime p of the solvability of that, <coughs> and uh, it should be solvable into real numbers. So it's kind of a global, uh, local to global principle, uh, exactly analogous to the result of green tower Ziegler, short range rules. Um, okay, so as an example, uh, one could, for example, look at the pair of equations, P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals N, so the Goldbach equation, but we also require uh, 2P1 minus P2 to be a prime, that's it. And all of P1, P2, P3, we want to come from a short interval. So that's the point. And um, uh, we can find solutions to this kind of equations and even ask them to look <coughs> number of solutions. Um, okay, so that's one application. Uh, another application we saw, uh, so as I said, this extends the work of uh, Greenthal Ziegler. Uh, another application we saw this mentioned briefly is to uh, the L2 convergence of multiple ergodic averages. Um, so Franz Ignatis, Horst and Krah, and William Ziegler considered uh, multiple ergodic averages of the primes. And we can now prove a version of the result where the primes are taken from a short interval um, of length x to the 5 over 8, which very much the same proof because the key input is the Gauss uniformity of the primes. Okay. Um, and so I mentioned that um, the higher uniformity of the Mebius function relates to Charles Nexter. Um, so uh, let me say what kind of uh, partial results towards Charla we can get from uh, for our result. So um, so this is Charles conjecture. Um, it's known only for k equals two and k odd, but one can ask for average versions. And the kind of average version we can prove with matter of the recipe, um, Tau and Ziegler, is that um, for almost all shifts h up to x to the epsilon, um, this correlation of the Möbius function has cancellation. Um, so, of course, you want to make h as small as possible. If h was fixed, that 
would be charged with XRF, and they could do ACE up to XRF silent, almost all such choices. Um, so the, there's another, there are other um, average versions of uh, Chawla, for example, Matamagi Razuri and Tao had a version where they average over um, K different shifts, if you have a K point correlation. Um, so there, they just needed to shift to tend to infinity. Um, but the point here is that uh, we only have one averaging variable, uh, which makes it harder. And therefore, we can only do um, shifts of size x to the epsilon as opposed to uh, arbitrarily slowly growing shifts. And can you do other, I mean, you do arithmetic progressions, but could you do any other? Uh, yeah, in fact, we can do also polynomial progressions. Yeah. So any any linear pattern or any more or less any polynomial. Um, okay, and finally, uh, this result with about almost all intervals has applications to um, an average version of the hardy littlewood conjecture and to an average version of the divisor function, uh, divisor correlation conjecture. Um, so we can prove uh, that um, for almost all shifts h up to x to the one third plus epsilon, if you take the k-point correlation of the fermion function, you get the conjecture asymptotic of Hardy and Littlewood for this, for almost all h up to that number. And again, taking h fixed would be the Hardy Littlewood conjecture, which of course includes three primes. But this is the amount of everything that we needed for the result. And of course, one third here is exactly the same one third as we had for uh, the Gaussian uniformity of the Mangle function in almost all short intervals. Um, and similarly for the uh, divisive functions, so there's an open conjecture about the correlations of higher order divisive functions. Uh, with the predicted main term. And we can prove this on average if the shift goes up to x to epsilon. And again, the x to epsilon is the same as we had for the Gauss uniformity of tau k. <coughs> so these are relatively direct applications of our Gauss uniformity results. Sorry, uh, the constant from the hardy Littlewood conjecture, is it uh, positive for almost all edge? Uh, yeah, under some conditions. So as long as certain local conditions hold. So for example, you have n n plus one, they can both be prime. So as long as there are no um, mod p obstructions for any prime p, then it's positive. So as long as you can hope to find primes, there are no mod p obstructions, uh, the constant is positive. That's positive proportional. Okay. Primes. Um, and so, uh, the first result for h going up, up to x uh, follows from the um, green tau ziegler linear equation in French work. And also the divisor correlation connection for almost all h going up to x follows from the work of Mathiasen. Um, okay, so let me finally tell you a bit about the proof. <coughs> Um, and I'll concentrate on the case of um, the fermion function and almost all intervals. So there the exponent was one third plus epsilon. Um, most of our proofs follow uh, more or less similar strategies with some more, small differences. Um, okay, so the first thing to do is um, the same as in Adam's talk, so split into type one and type two sums. When you recommend the primes, you want to split into type one and type two sums uh, using, let's say, Heath-Brown's identity. And then our sum of lambda of n, E of Px of n, uh, reduces to understanding sums of um, exponential sums over products of k integers, where the k integers could be of any sizes, and we have to cover all pos possible uh, ranges for the sizes of these variables. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to prove type one estimates, type two estimates, and also uh, an estimate called a type I2 estimate. So let's start with the easiest one. So that's type one estimate. And it says that if one of the variables, so one of your ni is very big, we get an exit of one minus theta, then you can just uh, look at the uh, sum over that variable, let's say n1. So you take the n1 sum inside and all the other variables outside. And just consider this um, exponential sum over n1. There's an exponential sum over the integers. And the point is that the n1 variable is quite long. So we have a hope of understanding this exponential sum. And indeed, it's just a um, while sum. This one here, um, and what can show that it's small for most values of n two up to n k, unless p x is major arc. And if p x p x is major arc, um, that case we already understand well because we've subtracted off the model function, so the major arcs don't cause a problem. Um, and the point here is that we need this sum uh, here to be you have non-trivial length. So that's where the condition uh, the one variables is bigger than what my theta comes from. Okay. Um, secondly, we need a type I2 estimate. So um, if you look at the same exponential sum, uh, we prove, prove an estimate that works for k equals two, in which case the sum is over uh, the points under a hyperbola or rather between two hyperbolas. Um, and in that case, we had the following idea of <coughs> partitioning all the lattice points under your hyperbola into several lines or anime progressions, such that um, there are not too many of these anime progressions and all the points under the hyperbola are disjoint union of these angry versions. So the angry versions completely cover all the points uh, with one-to-one -one correspondence. And very roughly, how to do that is that at any point, you approximate the slope of the hyperbola, and that's kind of the direction of your line. <coughs> and okay, so if we've split our sum over a hyperbola, into angular progressions. Now we can understand the sum because um, we can understand the sums of uh, E of P of N1 and 2 for N1 and 2 being an algorithmic progression. Um, because if, for example, um, let's say N2 is A and 1 plus B, here is just a quadratic function of uh, N1. And that's another polynomial. N1, so we can understand these kind of sums. Um, okay, so this is the idea we had for uh, dealing with uh, the k equals 2 case. And um, one could do something a bit similar for the um, for the Dirichlet divisor problem, which is the problem of um, counting how many lattice points you have under a hyperbola. Um, so there are many approaches to that, but one of them is to uh, do some sort of approximation of the hyperbola by, um, <coughs> by just lines and use that to get a simpler domain where you can count the points better. So here's a bit similar idea that we developed to this context. Um, and turns out this decomposition works exactly when the interval length is bigger than actually one third of epsilon. Um, it kind of relates to the Voronoi exponent that it's hard to uh, understand the divisor function in intervals shorter than next to one third. Okay, so that's one place where the one third comes from. Turns out it also comes from another place later on. Okay, so finally, what about type two estimates? Um, so they depend on uh, perhaps at first surprisingly on whether 
And what our polynomial p of x looks like? So we have the Archimedean case where e of p x of n is roughly n to the i t, and the non-Archimedean case where that's not the case. Um, now, one could ask, how can how can n to the i t be written as a, a polynomial exponential phase? Well, approximately it can because you can do the Taylor expansion of t log n. So n to the i t is e of uh, t over 2 pi log n, and I can do a finite Taylor expansion of log n up to a certain accuracy, and then that gives you a polynomial. So in fact, n to the i t is a special case of essentially an exponential phase. And we need a different argument for that case. Um, so let's start with the Archimedean case. Um, this is the easier one. So we were looking at lambda minus the model function. And now our exponential phase is n to the i t. So we can prove a good bound on this for almost all x, uh, with h being actually one to plus epsilon, using different polynomial estimates. Um, so I mentioned the result of Huxley and Ramachandra about this kind of sums with t equals 0. So they are based on Dirichlet Bonoel estimates. And turns out similar methods work. Also, you have the n to i t twist, because n to i t is multiplicative. So that's the key property of n to the i t. Um, so you split the formula function into type 1 and type 2 sums. And because the n to the i t is multiplicative, uh, it's not too harmful a factor to have here. And we get results, <coughs> in particular using the work of Baker half pits. Um, now, finally, what about the non Archimedean case? Um, so, here let me simplify a bit and let's say that P of x is actually a monomial, so alpha x n to the d. Uh, so, that's for simplicity. And so, we get a type to estimate in the region where a subset of the sizes of the variables, so alpha i are the sizes of the variables. If a subset of them is between epsilon and theta minus epsilon. Um, okay, so if we um, sort of split our variables into two groups, so the ones uh, whose product is in this range from x to epsilon to x to theta minus epsilon, call those variables A, their product, and let B be the product of the other variables and I. So then we have a type 2 sum where these alpha a and beta b are some coefficients, which you don't really care about. Um, and we have the exponential inside. So suppose that this is large for many values of x. So that's the contrapositive of what we want. Um, <laughs> then just by the picture on principle, one can show that the inner sum is large for, um, for many values of a. So let's say delta to some power times a, number of different values of a. OK, so we know that many of these inner sums are large. And this happens for kind of a positive proportion of all x. And for every x, there's a positive proportion of a for which this happens. So the fractions x over a are quite dense because there's a lot of them. So uh, actually, many of the x over a hit the same short interval. Um, so it happens that for the same short interval, we get many different x's, <coughs> for which we have this kind of relation. So many different x and a, for which this holds with the same interval. And now this requires a bit of work, but one can use the large sieve to show that um, Okay, so firstly, if you have a fixed interval and a fixed function, function beta, um, beta can only correlate with a positive number of different exponential phases on this interval, uh, where the bound depends on delta. Uh, and using this, one can show that um, this map x to alpha x, so alpha x is our worst possible uh, monomial, can be extended. So initially, it was for um, x between capital X and 2 capital X to 
x over 2a uh, x over a such that we have the following approximate functional equation. So there are many values of a between a and 2a such that um, the frequency here, so the frequency is alpha x a to the d, b is the variable, it has to be equal to alpha x over a. Uh, the point being that uh, for any interval x over a, they can only be bounded to many different frequencies for this large. Um, okay, so we get this kind of approximate functional equation that we need to analyze. Um, so what are the solutions of this? So there's one uh, function that clearly satisfies this, namely if alpha of x is t over x to the d, where t is independent of x. Uh, the sub should should be uh, actually x over x to the d plus one. Uh, but if, um, if you have t over x to the d, it satisfies this uh, equality, in fact. And what we want to show is that, that actually that's essentially the only solution. So up to uh, small errors, these are the only solutions to our approximate functional equation. Um, okay, so this requires some work. I'll say a little bit on the next slide, but if we have that, let's assume we have that, then our monomial alpha x and to the d is roughly t over x to the d and to the d. And what can I again do a Taylor expansion to roughly speaking write t over x to the d and to the d as n to the two pi i dt. Uh, Times of lower order phases that we don't care about. So up to up to some non-interesting factors, you get into the IT out of here. Um, when you were when you're on the short interval, so when your n is between x and x plus h. Um, and that then reduces us back to the Archimedean case, where a polynomial was essentially an Archimedean character. Um, okay, so this is the key claim that somehow we have to show that the solutions to this approximate functional equation are of this form. Um, okay, so here's the approximate functional equation. Um, in the paper with, uh, so the first of these papers, the one with automatic recipe, um, Tal and Ziegler, we have one approach for this functional equation, um, which used some graph theory, and uh, it was, uh, a similar approach was already used by Martin McGee, Rasmus, and Tal. Um, so the graph theory argument was just fairly complicated. Um, then um, after that, uh, Miguel Walsh found a simpler argument, uh, which he implemented for the degree one case. So he reproved that uh, Martin McGee, Rasmus, and Tal for uniformity of Mebius intervals of length x to epsilon with a much shorter proof uh, using a different method. And to start finally for us, this different method uh, is a bit more flexible and it works better for this problem. Um, which, uh, so in the other paper, we were working with the Mobius function and then all the um, integers A were actually prime and also this delta was fixed. So it was a more restrictive setup where it was easier to do some things. Here is a more general setup. Um, but what's this argument? Uh, it turns out we can adapt, adapt it to this more general setup. Um, and so very roughly speaking, kind of the idea is that, so we have this alpha x, which is the worst possible frequency for every x. <coughs> and we have shown on the previous slide that um, this alpha x, which was initially uh, defined between x and 2x, one can also define it on the interval x over 2a, x over a, such that these two intervals communicate in a certain way, a certain way being that functional equation. So one can extend alpha to the smaller interval such that we have certain relations between um, points on these intervals. And okay, so the key step in Walsh's argument is that. Um, Using a bit of combinatorics and a lemma, which I'm going to state in a moment, 
Um, if we have such a situation that these two scales communicate, it actually means that also uh, the bigger scale communicates with an even big, bigger scale, uh, AX to AX. And so if we know that, we can iterate it. Again, these two scales um, uh, communicate so we can pass to an even bigger scale, A squared X. And then eventually you get to uh, the original interval communicating with uh, A to the K X uh, to A to the K X for any K. And because, uh, so in all of the theorems, uh, our uh, interval length was at least x to the epsilon, which means that also this uh, capital A is at least x to the epsilon. In the boundary number of steps, we get to really big intervals. So you can make a to the k, we get an x, let's say, with uh, k being bounded. And once we are in such a big scale, turns out this approximate functional equation becomes easier to analyze. And one can use things like Winograder's lemma. Uh, about polynomials to analyze it. Um, so, yeah, one. Does this argument of false to pass to a much bigger scale and then it becomes an easier problem? And one of the tools used for this passing to a larger scale is the following uh, elementary lemma, uh, which generalizes Walsh's lemma. So, for Walsh, uh, the degree was one here, and the variables were prime. Um, so to set up is that if we have a function alpha defined on some dyadic interval, and if we have this kind of approximate functional equation, so n1 to the d alpha n2 is essentially n2 to the d alpha n2 modulo 1 for a positive proportion of all the pairs, then actually there exists an alpha star such that Alpha n has this very specific form. So for some small integer q, q times alpha n minus alpha star n to the d is extremely small. Um, <coughs> and what's interesting is that this is kind of an if and only result. So if you plug in such a function, let's say alpha n equals alpha star n to the d, where alpha star is constant into this, you just get zero. Uh, so it shows that the uh, obvious solution to this are in fact the only ones. Um, and the proof is not very deep, but it requires a bit of work. Uh, one sort of iterative gets better and better bounds on, on this um, distance. So at first one gets a relatively poor bound, but then one iterates it to get, get a better bound. But it's nothing too deep to prove that. Okay. And finally, we can put everything together. So recall that the exponent was one third was epsilon. And we had these parameters alpha one up to alpha k, which were corresponding to the length of the variables. So each of the variables has the length x to the alpha i. The type one case covers the case where one of the alpha i's is bigger than <coughs> uh, two thirds minus epsilon. So if that happens, very good. Uh, the type I2 estimate handles the case where we only have two variables, and this required theta being bigger than one third. And so the Archimedean case of the phase being n to the i t, we could handle for theta bigger than one third. So again, there's the limitation. Uh, although this one is maybe not such a serious limitation as this one. And finally, the type two estimate could handle the case where a subsum of the variables was between epsilon over two and theta minus epsilon over two. So if you have a variable less than one third, you could handle it. And what can easily check, it's an easy exercise to check that these cover all the possible values of alpha up to alpha k. And also if theta was any smaller, then you couldn't, uh, couldn't do it well. First, it, here there's a restriction and also you can say that there will be the, the worst case is when you have three variables all of the size one third. So that's the worst case. Um, and if theta was less than one third, uh, we can do that case. Okay, but um, 
so that's roughly speaking how we prove the result for the primes. And as I said, the other results are more or less variations of similar ideas using type one, type two sums and similar kind of uh, approximate functional equation in the case of uh, almost all short intervals. Okay. So I think I'll finish here. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't quite catch what you said earlier. Um, what you said. Um, so if, if H is some small power of log, you get shallow conjecture. Do you do you mean you get the full shallow conjecture or just the more very quick Yeah. Yeah. I have a question uh, in connection with Bloma's talk. Uh, you have other multiplicative functions. You 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 gave. Uh, divisor function or higher divisor functions and Mobius right at the beginning in von Mangel. Um, what happens if you have the Fourier coefficients of a modular form? Have you thought of that? Good question. Uh, so in our paper, we remarked that our methods don't work so well for them. <coughs> yeah, so they are, I mean, they are multiplicative if it's a homomorphic form, but um, Multiplicative is not enough, we would have to understand the values of the primes, which are not so well understood. So the values of the coefficients of the primes are not so well understood. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if our methods would work for that. Uh, for the case of long intervals, there's been some work of uh, He and Wang recently, um, yeah, where they looked at um, the um, Fourier coefficients of an automatic form twisted by neural sequences. Uh, but I'm not sure if our methods would work for any shorter intervals. I have more in mind a higher correlation. So if you take Fourier coefficients of a modular form, which is not dihedral, if it's dihedral, I mean, very much like, you see, uh, because you are only looking to gain some non-trivial bound, yeah. if you are, um, if you're not dihedral, then the, sum, the, the L1 norm and the L2 norm are different. So that's already an issue. Uh, that has to be built in into what the trivial bound is, right? Yeah, I think maybe Mathiasen has some work about um, correlations of um, the Fourier coefficients of automatic forms uh, over the long interval. So if you average um, h cos up to x, I think maybe she has some uh, results. So all I'm driving at is you have these theorems for tau k, which you had many correlations. And of course, with modular forms, you can do the uh, uh, shifted convolution, but you, nobody can do anything further, even on the long sum. Yeah. So I'm curious whether you can say anything because uh, in uh, I guess with the tau k. Can you just go back to your first? Oh, it's gone. No. Um, uh, which one? The, the very first th the the tau k theorem, the correlations of tau k. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess, so you need to know for tau k, uh, what you're comparing with to get the, the main term here is log uh, uh, c. So it's really that you are using those are positive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the only result I know about such correlations for, um, for at least certain um, Fourier coefficients of uh, ordinary forms, I think is by Mathiasen. And that's for a sub to x. But um, yeah, I don't see how our methods would work for that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to ask actually about this, the first theorem here. Uh, yeah. So you average up over only one parameter, but yeah. if you if you now instead want to average over many parameters, can you make them smaller than x to the one third? Uh, yeah, so if you had um, k minus one parameters, um, then um, one could control it, controls this by just the u2 Gauss norm instead of the uk Gauss norm. Um, or um, yeah, or, or even the you want you want Gaussian actually, and therefore one can do better things. Uh, so for k cos two case, um, uh, there was an earlier result of Matemagor and Tal where they could do intervals of roughly length x one quarter. Some exponent is roughly x one quarter for k cos two, and I think the same methods would work for higher k if you had k minus one different average parameters. So then I think you could maybe do x one quarter or so. Okay. Still a power of x. Yeah, still a power of x, yeah. Okay. 
Can you just yeah. So does this simplification of Walsh uh, lead also to a simplification on the argument about the local uniformity of the Mobius function or an improvement? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we, we do that in the in the fourth column paper because we also work with the Mobius function in intervals length, extra epsilon. Um, and yeah, so everything boils down to understanding this approximate functional equation and solving it. And since this method gives a shorter solution to it, um, yeah, so so our result about um, so the slight improvement to the earlier result we had from uh, 2020. Um, this one. Um, yeah, this one here, so the Mobius case here. Uh, so the slight improvement is the, that the exponent set is now smaller. Uh, so this we prove now with Walsh's argument. So it also gives an independent proof of, of the result we had for but, oh, uh, x but well, So the length of the interval, the next slide. Yeah, uh, the age. Yeah, so that we haven't we haven't figured out uh, how to improve with Walsh's argument. I want to ask the big question about this this functional equation part because I think I really have a good feel for what's going on. So, I mean, if bad solutions to this functional equation existed, what would they look like? Or is I mean, is the point that you're trying to show that the only solutions are these multiplicative ones? Are... Yeah, yeah, that's what we're trying to show. Uh, and we assume that there exists some solution, uh, and so using the uh, the assumption that this alpha x comes from a type two sum, uh, we could show. Uh, so we showed it um, here that we have this approximate functional equation. Um, yeah, here, uh, which, okay, so the conclusion is that uh, the original alpha x can be extended to another scale such that um, the function at scale x is related to the function at scale x over a. And then um, one can do a bit of um, cost routing arguments and things to. Um, to show that if you have such a relation between two scales, then you can actually uh, have a similar relation. So you can extend alpha x also to this bigger scale, ax, where you have the completely analogous uh, relation holding between these two scales, and then one can iterate it. Uh, so it's a relatively but not too complicated combinatorial argument that allows you to uh, pass from um, a relation between two scales to a relation between two bigger scales. And eventually you get to a very large scale and then you can understand your functional equation better. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the thing I can't get my head around is that I'm not used to thinking of the wrong of function just by the leading term in its Taylor series, but maybe that's uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a slight simplification indeed. Uh, so for, for d equals one, I mean it, it would be um, more accurate because then uh, yeah, I mean log n on the interval from x to x place is like t over x times n, essentially. Um, yeah, so I can think of the d equals one, one case for mm. others. Maybe a little bit of a technical question, but so this alpha x is kind of the worst of all the- Yeah, questions. the worst possible frequency. Yeah. Uh, what if you have multiple ones? How do you choose them? So they- uh, like So there, there can't be too many. That's again by the large C. So if you have, uh, if the, some is bigger than delta times h, they can only be delta to some negative power of many different alpha x. Uh, so, so that we use here. So, so there are not too many that, uh, that the same function can correlate with. But then so one can pass to a subset where it's fixed. Okay. But then with this equation, you could still jump between these different kind of things in different intervals or not? Uh, yeah, but we fixed one, one choice. So, I mean, there might be many, there might be like delta to the minus, let's say 100 different choices for this one. But we can pass to a subset. So uh, if we decrease our density <coughs> by some power of delta, by the Pistonhoff principle, we can fix this one because there are not too many choices. So passing to a subset, we can fix that frequency. I have more questions. It's not a thing.